All right, welcome to Environmental Science at Southern Virginia University. I'm Dr. Samuel Hurt, and this will be our introductory lecture getting into um, what we're going to talk about in this course. So first off, most of this information for the course is taken from this uh, textbook, uh, Environmental Science Toward a Sustainable Future. Um, and so you'll need to get this textbook for the course. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I received my PhD in ecology from Auburn University where I also got my master's degree and did an undergraduate degree at Brigham Young University. Um, I'll go over this in class so I won't bore you with the details again, but um, just a little bit about me and my educational and teaching experience. So what we're going to talk about in this lecture is first, um, it's really my theory that Everyone is an environmental scientist, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who holds this opinion, but I'll explain why I believe that. Uh, then we'll talk about the paradox of um, the environmental um, realization, really, in society, and talk about, finally, the three unifying themes of environmental policy, which is sustainability, science, and stewardship. All right, so first off, I don't know if anyone ever saw this cartoon I did growing up called Captain Planet, where uh, this uh, Captain Planet was a superhero who you know, was a protector of the natural resources of the Earth. Um, at the end of every episode, it said, the power is yours. So the power is yours to take care of the Earth was the main, um, the main point. Um, and I kind of agree with this notion, really, that everyone has the responsibility and would actually appreciate the other people um, taking on the responsibility of taking care of their environment. So humans rely on the environment for everything that we um, do. In order to live, we have to grow food that comes from our environment. Um, the things that we use, uh, the homes we create, all of this in one way or another, it comes from our environment. We can't make things out of nothing. So we have to have an appreciation for the environment. Um, we also alter the environment when we use it. Um, and this means that nothing you do can have no effect. Everything that you use and consume um, has to come from that environment. And as you do so, it alters the environment in some way. Um, in addition to this, we have found if you do not take care of the environment, um, it leads to a degradation in human health. So a healthy environment allows for healthy living, including you know, water that's not contaminated, air that's not contaminated, um, and you can go down the list from there in the things that we use. Um, finally, well, not finally, but everyone wants the availability of environmental resources to continue. So from day to day, you want to keep on using these same things. You want food to eat, water to drink. And so the preservation of the environment is vital to that and making sure that um, pollution you know, and the consuming of these resources doesn't ruin it as well. So the sustainable use or the ability to use stuff without completely destroying it is a common goal for all people. So um, I'll get this sometimes where, where I say I'm a biologist, I'm a scientist, I'm an ecologist. People will say, well, you some kind of tree hugger. And I'm like, well, we all, you know, like to have trees. We like to have paper and wood for our houses. So, um, yes, I like trees. And I think everyone does. And you can't really argue that everyone at some level has to want to preserve the environment. The second... Uh, point that I think is that everyone is a scientist. Uh, whether you go through making um, experiments or not as a profession, you still follow some resemblance of the scientific process in your daily decisions. So everyone forms a hypothesis or explain um, the patterns that they see around them, right? And as you gain more information, you may change your, the way you think, the way you um, form hypotheses. And you may discard some of the, the notions that you used to think. So if you consider some of the things you thought as a child because of, you know, just how you thought things worked, um, 
it's probably changed quite a bit since then. And that's really um, the basis of the scientific um, scientific process. So really, everyone's a scientist. Everyone is a, an environmentalist. Therefore, everyone is an uh, environmental science scientist to some extent, right? All right, so these are some of the uh, kind of breakdowns of how, you know, uh, people, professions, science um, intersects, right? So an ecologist is someone who studies the connection between living and non-living things in an environment or an ecosystem. Um, the work of ecologists is very important for how we understand our environment. So this is somebody who studies the environment that we live in. Um, an environmentalist is someone who recognizes the need for preservation of ecosystems and their services, which at some level, like we said, is all of us. Conservationist is someone who advocates for the preservation of species or another environmental entity such as a forest or a swamp or wetland or, you know, species, um, so on and so forth. An activist is someone who's publicly advocating for a cause, um, and this may be an environmental cause. So not all activists are environmental activists, but that is one branch of activism. A lobbyist is someone who appeals to lawmakers for a certain group or interest, also may be environmental or anti-environmental. Um, so you may be a big oil lobbyist, uh, which can have devastating effects on the environment, or maybe you are, or maybe someone could be a endangered species lobbyist, someone who's trying to get uh, protection for an area of environmental concern. Uh, economists are also very important for the understanding of the environment because how we use the environment affects, you know, how we um, gain monetary value from harvesting or from not harvesting a certain area. So economists are also very important for understanding how environmental decisions are affecting the everyday monetary income of 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 people in a in a society. All right, finally, environmental scientist is someone who studies the impacts of humans on the environment they live in and or finds technological solutions to these negative impacts. Okay. So this isn't a comprehensive list, but just a list of of, of things I came up with that, which I think are showing really the crossover between our everyday life, our, our scientific community, and um, environmentalism. All right, so now, the paradox. So um, in this in an in environmental paper which came out in 2010 um, by a lot of different authors, they uh, came up with some uh, theories, really, on, uh, on the environments and the human predicament with their environment. And their, their fundamental finding was that over the past 40 years, human well-being has been steadily improving while natural ecosystems have been declining. And so the paradox is, well, how can this be? How can we be doing better as people while the resources and things that we use, which come from our environment, seems to be uh, declining? Okay. And in this figure, you can see uh, this green line would be the tipping point for a lot of these different ecosystem services. And for many things, it seems like it has tipped over. It's gone over a, an area where there is no return. Okay, so it's a paradox because we use things from our environment um, and if it's not being preserved, then that should degrade our human well-being. But it hasn't, hasn't yet. All right, so let's go into some of the fundamentals. First of all, is human well-being actually increasing? So some statistics, right now we have a population growth of 7.4 billion, which is currently still increasing. So this suggests that, yes, we are, um, you know, we're at least adding people to our to the world so there must be enough resources to do that right it's projected to be 9.3 billion by 2050 and by that time you should have kind of a cap like we shouldn't um it be increasing past 9.3 billion just by projections so the question is then is their well-being increasing is the well-being of these 7.4 billion people which continues to climb 
Well, there are some indices which have helped us look at that, and that's called the Human Development Index, which looks at life expects, expectancy, education, and income. And um, these are the tracking of some of these over many different countries. You see all the different lines here. From 1970 to 2010, generally, most countries increased in these uh, indices of the Human Development Index. There are a few that didn't, right? That kind of dip down, maybe increase some and then dip down. But generally, things increased. Um, but there still needs to be some improvement. So we made these Millennium De Development Goals, the UN did, in 2000. And those were supposed to be achieved by 2015. A lot of them were achieved, but a lot of them were not achieved. And most of them had to do with education and improving well-being in uh, especially third wheel, third world or low-income countries. So now there are some new UN goals which are kind of replacing these developmental goals. These are sustainable de developmental goals for the next 30 years um, to continue to increase the well-being of developing countries. But generally, yes, well-being does seem to be increasing. All right, what about ecosystems? Are they really um, being degraded? So our ecosystems provide our goods and services for our economies and for our personal use. Goods include products of the ecosystem, such as fruit, wood, oil, water, you know, things that we harvest from the ecosystem. And services are processes that change the environment or the use of it in some way. So um, a wetland, which is what we see here, is a natural way for um, filtering uh, pollutants out of water. So the degradation of wetlands will mean that we have to spend more money cleaning up our water. But if you restore wetlands, you can have some natural ways of filtering out and cleaning water. So that's one ecosystem service. So the question is, are the ecosystems, ecosystems being degraded to the point where goods and services are no longer available? And at that point, you would think that human well-being would decrease. Well, let's look at our ecosystems. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessments was a effort by many different systems around the world to look at all the ecosystems of the world to determine whether they are actually being degraded or not. And their findings based on multiple different criteria were that 60% of them were being degraded, 20% were mixed, and about the other the 20% have been enhanced by human use. But the ones that have been enhanced are the ones that directly relate to our food consumption. So crops, livestock, aquaculture enhanced, timber and fiber have been mixed, and then most other ones are being degraded. And this is the same thing for cultural ecosystem service services, regulating ecosystem services and provisioning. So these are goods, these are services, this is cultural. So generally, however, they are being degraded and more and more to the point where they cannot be restored. So yes, um, ecosystems um, do seem to be being degraded. Uh, in addition, there are some worldwide trends which are very troubling. So first off is global warming. Uh, the earth is increasing in temperature. Its effects appear to have worldwide um, impacts on the changing of climates, which is causing among other things, uh, the loss of biodiversity of organisms, which is another indicator that our ecosystems are being degraded. So there are there's an extinction of species which continues to uh, climb. More and more species are being um, going extinct and becoming endangered um, due to habitat loss because of humans uh, and their development of food resources or, or um, cities and towns and roads and all the other things that we need to live. So are they in decline? Yes, it does appear that our ecosystems, for the most part, are in decline. Well, what does this mean? It means there are three different hypotheses that, again, these uh, researchers um, thought, well, this, this, if our ecosystems are in decline, but our human well-being is increasing, what are the causes? Well, it may be that food production outweighs the effect of ecosystem services. And this seems to be true. As long as people are eating and happy, then they don't, then, yeah, ecosystems are kind of um, <clears throat> set to the side for now. 
human technology makes us less dependent on ecosystems and that is true as well so we were able to make artificial fertilizers we were able to use um, fossil fuels and um, there's an abundance of them and it's cheap at this point so we can we can artificially create our own ecosystem and uh, lastly there's a time lag between ecosystem degradation and human well-being and this also does seem to be true as well um, so the effects of the de degradation of the ecosystem are not felt by us today at least not in a large part but they might and probably will be felt to our children and grandchildren is and more so as time goes on and they continue to do to degrade so these three hypotheses seems to have evidence for each of them um, and components of each are affecting how we use our environment today so um, now coming back kind of into the history of the environmental movement uh, it started in the US with the publication of a book by Rachel Car Carson called Silent Spring this highlighted uh, it was a fictional movie uh, fictional book but it uh, talked about real life environmental problems which affected human health and after its publication it really put these environmental impacts such as water pollution air pollution um, into the forefront of uh, of US mainstream culture and this led to environmental policy and government regulation including the Environmental Protection Agency a Clean Water Act Clean Air Act and Endangered Species Act and so now that after this environmental movement environmentalism is uh, more uh, the awareness is more abundant in our society and uh, we continue to have uh, environmental policies and good environmental policies are based on three things sustainability stewardship and sound science okay so we'll go through each of these individually starting with sustainability now, what is sustainability is something you hear a lot um, when talking about environmental issues, uh, we turn on the news and they talk about environmental and energy production, talking about sustainable energy. What it means is these are practices that allow indefinite consumption without degradation. Okay, so you can use part or uh, section off pieces of the ecosystem and the services and goods they provide without uh, permanently damaging them, so allowing them to recuperate. And so it comes from the um, this term when talking about goods of service is called sustainable yields, harvesting ecosystem goods at a rate that allows their replenishment. So you can take a number of fish from a fishery stock and they can recover from that, but if you take too much, then the fishery stock might crash. All right, so sustainable societies are in balance with their environment. Now, when you look at large scales as in countries no country in in the world at this point can say they are in balance with their environment but there all may there are maybe some societies maybe even some cities which could say they have a net impact of zero um, cities might be a little bit of a stretch but maybe some societies which live in balance with their environment such as um, uh, indigenous people of 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 certain areas but Generally, sustainable societies do not exist as of yet. And finally, sustained, sustainable development. So we want to improve well-being, but maybe not at the cost of ecosystem health, but with ecosystem health. And these are the challenges of sustainability, not necessarily um, being done currently. Now, sustainable solutions are ones that are ecologically viable, so they maintain the eco ecosystem health economically feasible so it doesn't require so many resources that you aren't able to do it and has the backing of the societies in which they are uh, living in so when you come to the cross-section of those three things you have sustainable solutions now uh, these are some of the um, things which may need to happen in order for a sustainable transition to occur first is we need a stable or declining human populations um, uh, and maybe not all these need to p take place but maybe they do in order for us to come in balance with our ecosystem 
Second, economies that are not dedicated to growth and consumption at the expense of ecosystems. So that seems to be the only indicator of, of how well a uh, economy is doing is how much they are growing. But if their ecosystems are being degraded, then maybe it's not, um, not as good. A technological transition to environmental friendly processes. So going from fossil fuels to renewable energy. A political or sociological transition to embrace um, a just approach to people's needs and that eliminates large-scale poverty and a community transition from car dominated urban sprawl and we'll talk about this later in the course to smart growth where you people can live in cities more livably all right so that's sustainability second one is science sound science all right um, so first off we need to talk about what is science. My definition is the formulation and or discrediting of objective explanations for the observations and phenomena of the physical biological universe. I know that's a mouthful. Basically, we come up with, with ideas for how and why things work. Um, and then we test those ideas. And that's, that's what science is. We test them in a way which is objective. So it's not an opinion, but something that has data which we can measure. And there are a bunch of different definitions here from uh, dictionary.com, but the underlying theme is that it's a process um, of, of gaining knowledge through experiment. Now, in order to do that, we have to have uh, forms of logic and we have to have forms of observation. So we see things, we notice patterns in the world around us, and we want to know how they work. Two ways in which we can use logic is deductive and inductive reasoning. So in deductive reasoning, we apply general principles to specific results. So that's kind of like what Sherlock Holmes does when he, when he comes up and he notices people. He has a keen observation of human behavior, uh, a general principle. And he can look at one person specifically and notice their behavior and fit it into different categories. Okay, I know that's a fictional... Um, fictional example, but uh, nonetheless, he does deductive reasoning in his application of human behavior. Inductive reasoning is kind of the opposite. It's where you come up with uh, specific observations, such as what Newton did when he noticed how things move, such as how an apple you know, fell and hit him in the head. Um, and then he came up with equations, measurements, and uh, different theories and laws and tested those laws over time on how things move and was able to come up with Newton's laws. Um, essentially taking these uh, observations and applying them to movement of everything. Okay, so that's inductive reasoning. Now with science we test different variables which are different factors which affect an outcome of an observation. So here are a bunch of variables which affect the growth of these um, muscles, okay? Um, and you may notice that most of them are the same except for temperature. So you have a warm and a cool site and everything. all the other variables are the same. Now, if you have that kind of setup, um, you would say this is, um, you would say that temperature, any differences in the outcome can be um, attributed to the variable which is different, which would be temperature in this case. Um, and this would be noticed in the field, but you can also do the same thing in a laboratory. So let's say we took some muscles and we grew them and we knew how much we, we um, gave them in water quality, food, muscles, types, and disease. All this we kept constant and we changed the temperature. Um, and this would be our test experiment. So in one experiment we would keep them uh, all the factors are the same, and one and the other experiment we would change slightly. So in this one we would give it a cooler temperature. And again, any any difference in the two can be attributed to the change in that variable. All right, so this is this test experiment is part of the scientific uh, method, which we um, we use as scientists to come to certain conclusions about our hypotheses. So first off, in order to form a hypothesis, you have to gather information. 
Then once you do, you can uh, come up with a way to test it and form conclusions from that test uh, after you gather the data. Now, this might not necessarily come in this step-by-step uh, -step process. We may have to come back and revise our hypotheses after doing our tests, or even before we do our tests. We might not find a test that's good enough to test our hypotheses. So this kind of middle area here can get kind of messy. Um, but from our conclusions, we can gather evidence for or against our hypothesis. And um, through repetition of our tests, and we can validate whether it's uh, our first test was good. Um, and then we can uh, communicate those findings in uh, peer-reviewed journal articles or conferences. But again, uh, this may require us to revise our hypotheses and go through multiple different tests in order to come to any valid conclusion before it, it occurs. Now this means that the scientific method is subject to um, lots of um, error, essentially. There are some weaknesses to it, including bias, human error, confounding factors, meaning factors that we don't, don't even know that are there, but may be affecting the outcome. Uh, the scientific method also doesn't prove anything, right? It, it gathers evidence for or against the hypothesis. It doesn't prove it. Um, actually creating or you know proving things um, takes m a larger body of evidence, lots of different uh, scientific experiments, and even then it's, it's held as a law or a theory um, and not necessarily, pr we, we still don't say it's proven to be true. It is generally slow, it takes a long time. It, you generally reveal more questions than answers through your experiments. There are ethics which need to be considered when carrying out your experiments. Funding, uh, you have to have money for your experiments and where you get that money may affect your ethics and your findings. Um, and then once they are actually done, they can be misreported uh, or trend, the, the communication of your results may be misinformed as well. Or um, your results might be um, tampered with to um, maybe present something as more concrete than it actually is. And this is what happened with the um, vaccines and autism link. It was done by a scientist who falsified a bunch of, bunch of his results in order to come to this certain conclusion. And it started, you know, who knows how much money was spent in um, retracing and trying to find that link. They never actually found a link. And they also found that, it, you know, eventually found, came out that he falsified his report um, and created a, a big stir about it. Um, junk science is also science that's manipulated or biased in its in its um, in its methods. So there's lots of different weaknesses to the scientific method. But that being said, it is still the best way in which we are able to learn about our, our environment, about uh, which we are able to apply technology, um, and is important for us to be able to understand what our effects are to our environment. Now, the different types of studies, you may have observational studies where no experiment is de being done, such as this guy and this puffin. You may have controlled laboratory experiments, such as which is often done with mice or rats. Um, you can have a correlational study, such as this, where you have per capita daily meat consumption and the incidence of colon, colon cancer, and cancer in a bunch of different countries. This is correlational, meaning we didn't do a test to say that this is what causes this. We just looked at the information and saw that this and this are connected in some way. You can have a quasi-experimental um, study where uh, maybe this is usually done in the field where you have some sort of setup which is similar to a controlled laboratory. Some very um, you can also use a lava flow and you may still plants and organisms start to colonize this area. Um, lava fields have a lava flow thick. Finally, after much scientific um, uh, debate, generally, verification, validation, lots of studies, um, some things become theories, which is different than what you use in common 
speech. In common language, a theory is just a guess. Right? When you say, I have a theory about this, it's usually just, you know, maybe educated, but still just some type of guess for how things work. In science, it means something that, it's, that has been tested over time by facts, observations, and, and patterns. Okay? So it's more concrete than our general term would indicate. So some of these include like germ theory. <clears throat> so germ theory is that you have microorganisms which cause you to get sick and these microorganisms live everywhere. I think most people would agree that that's pretty true. Um, but you know 300 years ago germ theory didn't exist and or, or was just being developed and uh, it was not common knowledge that you had to wash your hands after going to the bathroom. All right. Um, so theory of evolution, Newtonian physics, cell theory, all these are very concrete um, theories in science which ha are, are supported by a lot of evidence. All right, the last, um, the last uh, piece of environmental policy um, is stewardship, okay, which is basically the actions and programs that manage natural resources and human well-being for the common good. So the idea that there's a responsibility uh, that humans have towards their environment um, and involves implementation of ethics, and ethics is the study of what is good, what should be done, and what provides justice and equity. So a steward then is someone who takes upon themselves the responsibility to um, uh, provide solutions, in, you know, environmentally or otherwise, and <clears throat> and their consumption is um, ethically sound, right? Um, so the stewards of the earth, and this is where you can kind of get into um, religious theory as well. What are the religious um, policies, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, about what is your responsibility um, spiritually towards your environment? And uh, we will discuss these uh, in class as well. So my final question for you to, for us to leave on is, what is your stewardship towards the environment? Um, are you a steward of environmental policy? Is, is it your responsibility to come up with solutions or to be actively involved in, um, in, in mentoring policies or helping policies? Or uh, should you even have an opinion? Or are you just kind of stuck in the middle um, with uh, no ability to do anything. And we'll talk about that in class as well. And we'll also talk about the LDS um, and or other religious um, perspectives on environmentalism. All right, that's it for our introductory lecture on environmental science. And we will um, get into these uh, in more detail throughout the course.